Baradah. Um, as the freewheeling, happy-go-lucky people we are, um, <laughs> I'm messing around with the schedule this morning. And rather than go first into the reflections um, that was on the, uh, on the program at the beginning, uh, we'll go straight into, in just a moment, inviting Elaine onto the stage so that she can talk. And then we will keep the, the other discussion part until later in the morning. Now, this, this means two things, really. Essentially, uh, you won't be getting your coffee break at 10 15 or whatever it was. Oh. Uh, you'll be at 11 15 instead. You won't be talking on this. It's a hustle break. Yeah. <laughs> to mention is that um, does everybody who needs a headset have a headset? Okay. We're about to do the trial of the um, foundation system. And I do want to emphasize again to all of you Welsh speakers, please, um, you know, we've, we've set this up so that we can do this um, in both Welsh and English. If you wish to, please, please do feel free to ask questions to respond in Welsh there as well. So I think we did less of that yesterday than I thought we would do. Um, so the option is here, please do use it. Um, and I'm looking at me now. There's nothing else we need to announce before we start this way, I don't think. In which case, <clears throat> on a very, very carefully scripted introduction, um, I wish to introduce my very good friend Elaine to speak to you. It's my favorite introduction. I asked him to please use it. <laughs> Otherwise, you sound like you're alive for your own obituary. I hate it. Uh, my name is Elaine Human Gurian. I get um, fussy if you leave human out when you write about me in print, but you don't have to refer to me as that. Everybody refers to me as something else, whatever it comes to mind, especially since I've now delayed your coffee. <laughs> um, we're going to do a whole lot of things this morning, but let me start with this. Um, it doesn't trans, it's not dark enough in the back, so on your way out, if you're welcome to use this. This is my email, it's egurian at egurian.com. I feel very sexy that I own my own domain name. <laughs> Um, it's spelled E-G-U-R-I-A-N, um, and Egorian is um, my email, and you're welcome to write me, and I answer those things. My website is egorian.com. Um, about 10 years, I started to have the privilege of being on the board of TIPA. And I had a Fulbright in Argentina for three months, where I discovered that a whole world does not buy books and knows how to hack the internet and knows how to hack software. And it became, it was very clear to me that the privilege of buying books, having disposable cash in a country with a sustainable finance um, was not everywhere in the world. And at that moment, I, established egorian.com and broke the copyright of all my publications and they are all there um, and they're all for free and they're all downloadable and they're all yours um, www.slideshare.com which is linked to my website is all my powerpoints and they're all yours and they're all downloadable and mess aroundable as long as you leave human in the middle of my name. Um, and if you know how to use Pinterest, how many of you have a Pinterest account? Those who did not raise your hand get a Pinterest. <laughs> it's free. Here's why. Uh, people, I wrote a, a paper called the Pinterest Museum Pinterest is the way in which people teach themselves art history. 
teachers share curriculum. And I have a site, I have many sites on, on Pinterest, but I have a site called Museum Educator. So it's www.pinterest.com backslash Museum Educator, one word. It has 70 different boards about exhibition ideas. Um, I did it again for TIPA, but I use it in many places, and you are welcome to use it. And here's how you use it. So we were talking yesterday about we need skills and exactly how you do things. This is all skill-based stuff. This is, this is all my worksheets. Use them. But how does, how does museum educator work? So there's 70 different boards. One of them will say interactive exhibitions or interactive, yeah, exhibits. And you can look up many good ideas more than you ever had in your life. And as you're thinking we should do interactivity, here are good ideas. But the political use of it is you take it to your director and you point. Because at the bottom of each one of these, it says where it comes from. So you point to them and you say, we're not going to be the first to do this. You see, it's been here. It's at the Tate or some other place where your director will be impressed that they're associated with. So it's both an idea tool and a political tool. It's a way also to educate your own staff by saying, when I talk about, in this case, interactivity, here are some examples I mean. And it's in shiny pictures, and it doesn't look like you're just waving your hands or you're just inventing something. Because one of the things we discovered about the way in which people learn is they would like to be the second or the third on their block, not the first. They like to think of themselves as the first, but they get much more comfort if they see somebody else did something like this before. So it's an educational tool for you to not only think about what other op opportunities you have, but it's an educational tool in which you can use it as a staff training. Now, Pinterest allows you to make your own tool. And you can download all my stuff and make it your own and put it under your own name. So those of you who don't have Pinterest, it's the world's best flat file. It allows you to download for free with a tiny app every single visual on the internet <coughs> and curate it in your own form. But it also allows you to watch everybody else curating theirs. And if you read the paper called the Pinterest Museum, <coughs> what, what you'll understand is I'm very big in collecting in my own head of what I call non-judgmental service providers because, and I'll give you an example of what that is, Pinterest being one of them. One of the ways people learn is that if they can get a repeatable service providing that is not making judgment about them, they will venture out in the quiet of their own home and teach themselves things, or they will use this. And here are examples. The library does not make a distinction when you check out a book between Plato and how to fix my toilet. Those are two similar transactions. That's a non-judgmental service delivery system. They don't care what the particularities are. And because they don't, you can learn it once and use it over and over again. Every shopping mall has a food court. And every parent with screaming children in the car knows that. Because you can go to a unfamiliar shopping mall, get food for your kid, because you know the service delivery system of a shopping mall. They all have a food court. They all have at every place in the intersection of their stairways a, a glossary, and you can figure out what you're doing. I am for, as the backup to democracy, collecting in one's head non-delivery service providers and understanding how to use them. And one of the conceits of museums is the way to find the toilet in my museum is entirely different than the way to find the toilet in yours, which drives every single parent crazy. And since I opened museums, 
it is the single most asked question for the first year, which is where is the toilet? I think that's unfair. But I think more than that, it's a barrier to entry. <clears throat> if you think, I've never been to this place, I may have a bad time, and I will not find the toilet, I'm not going to it. So it's not only you don't display what you think you display or everybody wants to come, Museums have arrogated to themselves kind of one-off systems so that I can't learn museum system by going to one museum and extrapolate at another, like I can at a shopping mall. And one of the reasons that the demographics of libraries are different than the demographics of museums is that no one is going to comment on your choice of book and you know how it works, and they taught you at school. So keep that in mind, that's a tool about can you reproduce the system? Wayfinding in your museum is, is that. Sometimes I call it the secret decoder ring. If in the lobby it, you can figure out they use this typeface for me, and this is the map for me to find my way, that's a repeatable system. If we, in the front lobby, tell people the system, and if we use what I call layering systems so that they can figure out how it's going to repeat itself, they're already armed in better ways than if, you don't know, are they all up? Are some at the side? Some are at the, well, hospitals put them all on the floor, but you know that. The minute you see blue and it says operating theater, you understand unless you want an operation today, you're not going there. That's a system you understand. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's that. What are we doing today? So this is the, the name of, kind of the generic name of what we're doing, but I'd like to reframe it. But before I reframe it, this is what we're gonna do today. Let me start with my biography. Um, in order to reframe it for you. Um, I am, as you know, an American. <coughs> um, I'm 82. For purposes of my series of alarm, I'm also the child of German Jewish immigrants and I was born during the Holocaust. Uh, the Holocaust is the leitmotif of my childhood. The war doesn't end until I'm seven. Um, and the Holocaust and Jews in America has a very particularity. So I am the first generation American born member of my family. What that means is in a family that fled, my parents did not flee. My father came to America in 1924 because he heard he could make a fortune. And unlike almost everybody who's gives you that first line, my father made a fortune. He came to America, thought he could make a fortune, made a fortune, died a happy man. He also knew Donald Trump's father. My father was a Trumpian character. He built it in part of a suite of builders of Queens, of which Fred Trump is one. My father is also one. They divided completely this way between the anti-Semite Christian builders who built apartments that said no Jews were allowed and Jewish builders who built apartments but who equally said no blacks were allowed. My father was not a saint. A very interesting man, but hardly a saint. He hated Trump's father, but he referred to Trump's father as old man Trump which only now has tipped to me that he must have known there was a young man, Trump, who was the current president of the United States. Um, I live next door to Donald Trump, fortunately not at the same time. <laughs> but when Trump's house came on the real estate market, I said, oh, I know that address, and indeed I lived in the same house next door. Um, but I am much older than he is, and therefore we missed each other in the street activity. Why am I telling you this? Uh, because as I said to everybody this morning, 
Jews in America go to Sunday school or Jewish Hebrew school, sometimes called, or something. But they go to school to learn Jewish traditions. That's how they get bar mitzvah. That's how they get everything. And almost all Jews in America, whether their parents are observant or not, and especially if their parents are not observant, they feel obligated to send their children to some form of weekly education. And about the age of 11 or 12, since all of us understand about the Holocaust, we ask questions like, how could that possibly have happened? If all you know is that there were killing camps, and you live in the United States of America post-war, you are trying to figure out how do you go from the country you know to killing camps under the regime of a government. And so about 11th or 12th grade, they teach the run-up to the killing camps. They teach proto-fascism in Germany. Jewish day schools, Jewish Sunday schools. So Jews in America know the proto-fascist playbook. Why am I telling you this? Because when Trump started to run for president, the first people in the country who held up their hand and said, just wait a minute, please. This is proto-fascism. We have seen this before. This use of turning down the press and turning up racism, we have seen this before. It is the run up to the Holocaust. And all of a sudden, I was watching, because I was hysterical, and I am married to a non-Jew, and he was, he's a Minnesotan, so they show no affect. I don't know if you know anything about it. So having a hysterical wife is a little complicated for him. Mako's laughing because Mako's a big friend of my husband, and he knows exactly what is going on. Uh, Dean has to then go walk the dog. I mean, what is he going to do with this person who's saying this is proto-fascism? But the Jews in America from all walks of life start to be the canary in the coal mine. And they talk about, and they first call out that what is going on with the president-elect of the United States is proto-fascism, and what is going on in America is unimaginable to us who were saved and now live in the land of the free. And I tell you that because, and I said to my colleagues this morning, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the notorious RBG. Do you know about the notorious RBG? Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is the oldest member of the Supreme Court of the United States. She has been made into a cult figure. She's a little bitty woman, older than I am, has beaten cancer many times, very studious. She is known as the notorious RBG, and she loves being known that. But one of the constraints of being a Supreme Court justice is in order to prove your justice, you never speak out on matters of contemporary concern. It will compromise your ability to judge. You never speak out except about jurisprudence. Ruth Bader Ginsburg says, this is proto-fascism. Trump is a proto-fascist. Everybody gets hysterical, like she's the Supreme Court person. She will have to apologize. She apologizes. Now, she's the oldest serving Supreme Court justice. She knew she would have to apologize. She could not bear it. She needed to warn America. Um, so I start with that view. I start with where am I moving to, how am I fleeing, what country am I going to. And like most Holocaust traumatized people who were not in the Holocaust, I have money in foreign countries, namely this country. And I'm here in this country when Donald Trump gets elected and my husband calls me in the morning and he says, are you coming home? And then he says, what makes you have a husband you love? He said, because if you're not, I'm coming where you are. Even though he thinks this is completely crazy. So this morning I thought, 
am I going to say all of this to you? Because does it put me in some jeopardy in my life, in my country? As David pointed out, aren't we lucky to be able to say that? And the answer is, this saying is a small piece of bravery, but it's what activism is about. Yes, I'm going to say it. But what I'm also going to say to you is that I don't know anything about Brexit. America is so consumed with Donald Trump that you have to look at, at to try and find news of foreign lands. Um, so I'm hoping that what I do know about, which is all the machinations of how government works, having been a government official, of the United States, what I'm going to talk about is resonant for you. But you're going to have to make the leap, the bridge, because I don't have it. So this is an entirely American-based, American-referenced speech. And I want to change the terms of reference because what we talked about yesterday, which was really important stuff and a really good day, was based on an assumption that you have a bedrock country, you want to change your, your way of doing things in the museum world, you wish to become more inclusive, there are underrepresented people, and you have an organic process time in front of you. So some of you are in different locations in your process moving, and we all talked about how you would move your process along. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about museums and extremists, museums in emergency. I'm going to assume that Brexit is its own emergency. I'm going to assume that your country, this is as little as I know about your country, is almost as polarized as my country. And what I'm going to also assume is that we in museum land have a responsibility to at least make some efforts at healing the divisions. And so I'm going to look at strategies about healing divisions rather than strategies of organic changing for inclusion. And in thinking about that, what I am going to talk about surprises me. Because the way I think that we look at healing divisions is to move to the center. Now, I have my own self-personality, and it's dependent on being an activist. I was at the, it, some of it is all exaggerated because I was a little and frightened person, but I was at the Martin Luther King March because I thought, you want to see him. Um, this centerizing, which is what I think the new title of my book is going to be, Centerizing the Museum, um, is surprising for me as a political activist position. But if my major role is healing, and if I want to look at the easiest definition of inclusion, <coughs> inclusion is everybody then one of the primary things I'm interested in is how do we include the people we don't know and don't like? Not how do we include the people we have either romanticized or know and like. And what I discovered for myself is that what, you, what we have done in America when we talk about inclusion is that we've picked and chosen who we wish to include that makes us feel well. So we have handicapped accessibility, and therefore we work with the disabled. And when you look at it, we work with the lawyer in the wheelchair, not the retarded acting out child. And when you look at mental health activity in the United States, we work with people with dementia, and we work with people on the autism spectrum. We don't work with violence or something else. So we have chosen and then congratulated ourselves for how inclusive we are. And now I'm asking myself, 
what does it mean to include if the direction you wish to go is healing the country? And that's what I'm going to talk about all morning. Um, and we're going to do some workshops. And we're going to do um, things writing on the board. And then we're going to do something I've never done before called the externalizing bartering list. And we'll see if it works. And if it doesn't, if you're all walking around going, I don't know what she's doing, then I'll know it doesn't work. So you're, you're the tryout. <coughs> Sorry about that. Or lucky you, whichever it happens. You can congratulate yourself if it will work. <laughs> this is Paul Krugman, How Democracy Dies American Style. This is from today's New York Times. <coughs> Who is Paul Krugman? Well, he is more hysterical than I am. He's however, and he's a Jew. He's a New York Times columnist. But should you not, want, if you wish to dismiss him, as Donald Trump loves to do, he's also the Nobel Prize winner for economic theory. This is two years in. His this morning, he has endless um, opinion columns. This is about how two years in, that democracy is dying. And there seems to be a new book called How Democracies Die. Let me get. He wants to announce that the Justice Department has been corrupted. Um, for those of you who don't know what Sharpie Gate is, it's about the corruption now of the weather forecasting. And he ends with, that's why I'm scrolling down. <coughs> I mean, that's what he wants to alert people in the New York Times with. But the people who read the New York Times are not Trump supporters. Because Trump has decided that this is the fake news broadcast. The most respected newspaper in the United States, which is virulently anti-Trump. Trump denies his supporters to read. And then there's this. The point is that this is how the slide to autocracy happens. What they do instead is use their control over the machinery of government to make life difficult for anyone considered disloyal. That's today's article by a man who was one of the first people to call this out as the beginning of proto-fascism. He was one of the first for me to say, Krugman, he's an economist. What is he talking about Trump? Oh. So for those of you who read my papers that I sent, this is the language and the issues that I'm interested in. And in reframing the how do you heal museums, this is the list of stuff that I'm interested in looking at. And if you want to know a little more about my biography, well, I'll tell you more whether you want to know more or not. Um, I help put the infrastructure in museums around the world, the big ones, the sexy ones, as long as they are museums of contested history. I'm currently working on <coughs> the Museum of the Euromaidan in Kyiv, Ukraine, the, the museum about the revolution that turned Ukraine from Russian leaning toward Western leaning. I was the senior consultant to the National Museum of New Zealand, of Australia, of the Jewish Museum in Berlin, of the African American Museum in America, and so it goes. But I do know content. I do infrastructure, and I do infrastructure as a matter of philosophy. 
So all of what I'm going to talk about is about infrastructure, about ways you deal with each other, with the staff, where your front desk is, what the public is understanding, not about your content. How you can use your collections, not about what your collections have. I am not a historian. I'm an administrator. But the other thing I do, and one of the things we put up yesterday is, do you have enough time to read other things? Now, I'm old and retired, and I spend five months a year writing, lucky me, it's everybody's dream, and reading. But you have to carve out time. Because one of the things that everybody asking you something one of the ways I carve out time is I have, since I was a young woman, only gone to the office to pre present my body four days a week. So that the fifth day that somebody wanted me to put two thoughts together, I could do it in a place where I was not constantly interrupted. And the reason you need to do this is that there's a whole world out there, a theoretic world, that Mako showed you yesterday, Mariko showed you yesterday, the relationship between theory and practice that is important to learn. Museums suffer from not only arrogance but isolation. They are so busy they don't know that somebody else is thinking about things that would be helpful. And sociology is the place where it would be most helpful but not the only place. So where it says complexity, that's a theory. And as Mako and I commiserated with each other, we tried to learn complexity theory. And we learned enough to use it and to be dangerous, but not enough to really understand it because it has algorithms and charts and arrows. But we're going to talk about complexity. Ambivalence is a psychiatric term. And it's useful to have read psychology, and in this case, psychiatry, to understand how ambivalence works. So and some of these are otherwise. We're going to talk about normative culture and how normative culture works and what are norms. But you don't learn that in the museum world. So if you want to use norms and you want to apply them, you have to study from elsewhere. And therefore, carving out time is not a luxury. It is one of the ways you borrow and steal from everyone by reading other people's stuff. Um, make, um, we, got, we got handed out yesterday oh, the new definition of museums, mm -hmm. but Sue, who is the, the president of ICOM, who had to preside over what she knew was going to be a debacle, starts with this speech at the ICOM speech in Kyoto. Um, I'm not going to read all of it, but let me give you a minute to read it because this is a positioning statement by the president of ICOM at the World ICOM. And that is a positioning statement of alarm. As um, Hillary said yesterday, not when you're done. Okay, I'm going to assume enough of you had. This is what you got handed out yesterday, which got not voted down. It got parliamentarily maneuvered out. And that distinction is different. This is both a clean way to get rid of a hot potato, but also a coward's way to get rid of a hot potato. So it meant you could vote against or for the parliamentary issue of tabling it without ever recording whether you were for or against it. Um, it's what happens in big bureaucratic governmental locations. So it was not voted down. It was tabled. 
for purposes of my work, I have my own definition of museums, and this is the one that I wrote quite a long time ago, but I wrote it because it then tables what my work is about. And I call your attention to a couple of words here because they're the words that are important to me. I take the position that public civic spaces are a bedrock of peaceful um, ability to work with strangers, mostly in urban settings. There's many sociology stranger literature. I take the position, um, those of you who know Nina Simon's work, and she and I are friends, she's interested in strangers interacting with each other. I'm interested in strangers before they interact, seeing each other. I think the very act of traversing public space and seeing strangers and noticing they are fully human, wearing those funny clothes, but they seem to have children and they seem to love them in the same way you have children and love them, allows the beginning of peaceful negotiations. And that public civic space is one of the things museums own though they think their front door is the beginning of a private endeavor. So if you've read uh, the book a year ago from out of Leicester about public space, it was based on, and, and there's an article by me, and it was based on a, an article I wrote called Threshold Fear about the notion of crossing a threshold is already an act of bravery. And that turning your face toward the public, especially in your lobby, is not only useful, but it's a civic responsibility. And what that means as an interrogation <coughs> within your staff is already an interesting thing. Do we believe we're public? Yes, we believe we're public. Do we understand how difficult it is to find us? Yes, but that's too bad. And do we think that having a person at the front desk who strangers believe are judging them and are making an opinion about them and are profiling them is useful for, it, for in invitation? We don't think about that. But in fact, Libraries don't do that. Unless libraries are under great stress, the first person you meet, the librarian you meet, you have to decide to see, and they're off to the side. Because the entrance to libraries, at least in my country, is intentional so you can survey it before anybody talks to you. Which is much easier for people who are afraid because they're already <coughs> decoding the space. So my first definition is about what is our responsibility to public space. I understand we have stuff on the web. I understand that. But I'm interested in what is the negotiation between strangers? Do you know that the first thing that happens to cities that are under real stress is that they lose public spaces? People don't go there. And that, do you know that police and city officials try to reanimate public spaces because they understand their city becomes safer. So the planting of parks and the lighting of parks is often in the hands of the police, or at least the safety people. Public space is an, is an incredibly important part, the public sidewalk, the throughway, the throughway of Shopping malls in the UAE are public because the, the Emirates are hot and, and shopping malls are air conditioned and shopping malls are private places but the throughway spine is not because they understand that's a traversing place works like a street and should be a public space. There are public-private partnerships in the United States about public space. 
So what your lobby is about, the most complex place you have, and where your barrier to entry begins, and what you offer in the lobby has everything to do with invitation. Everything. And museums use systems to prevent three to, to present three-dimensional evidence. Evidence, I didn't use the word collection. Because I don't care about collection because I think reproductions are evidence, I think installations are evidence, I think ways of congregating together are evidence. I'm interested in what you're doing as social incursion in the public space, and collections are one of your very important tools, but not your only tool, which allow visitors to create and understand knowledge for themselves none of which we are very good at yet. What we're really good at is telling you what you should know. This is this. This is what we know about it. We know other people know other things about it, but we're not telling you that there are other people because we fight with them. So this is what you will know about them. That's how museums, when I entered them, what? They were bonded. The object was bonded with the, what the curator knows about it and their particular take, and that's what you all know about it, you Mr. and Mrs. Public. Thank you very much. But if you want to know an act of resistance, that taking out your phone is an act of resistance. Not a single human who comes to your museum is coming without a phone, and they're not dependent on you about that thing. So what Mako talked about yesterday, I'm interested in separating that out making the thing the thing, and then making it possible for many ways for the visitor on a quest to find the information they wish to make use of the thing in their pro public knowledge base. And that our job is to invent the ways in to <coughs> the thing, not the curator's take on the thing as the only thing we're talking about. So back to my Pinterest. Go to there. There are lots of ways about people doing that. So this is the question. How do you change the museum <coughs> you work in, you personally work in, so that it becomes relevant in these specific times of social need, these specific times, which are emergency times? quite like hurricanes or fires. And how do you make it more aligned with your personal moral values? Because without knowing what your personal moral values are, you can't figure out how you can help others. The first act of resistance is to do, a, is to do an audit of yourself. You are a player. People will accuse you. You're a white girl in a black museum. The answer to you're a white girl in a black museum is yes, I was born this way. And this is how I plan to use it. There ain't nothing I can do about that. That's part of the deal that I came with. So a personal inventory is part of your activist modeling. This is the stuff that um, Hillary said yesterday. Um, empathy and emotionality. I believe that museums were set up not only to show you our conquest so we have power, but it happened in the age of rationality and there was this notion of I can distance myself and I'm a neutral place and this information is information from God and it is the facts all of which we understand is not true, is my view of this information. But what we have had a hard time with is that there are whole knowledge systems that are faith-based. There are whole knowledge systems that have nothing to do with rationality. And we own stuff that was created to deal with different knowledge systems, especially faith-based stuff. And that to interpret it like 
Those people use this and think that when they use it, which was the underlying label which said and those people are wrong and are primitive, is not what we plan to do today in inclusion, but we don't know what we plan to do today with inclusion because then you have to start to deal with what is faith. What is the faith-based stuff? So at the Holocaust Museum, where I was the deputy, there's a section in where you can light a candle. Um, people who lost people in the Holocaust don't have the body. So people started to say the prayer for the dead. And if you go to Israel, and if you go to Poland, outside of the Poland Museum, you'll see this. Jews who do the prayer for the dead and who visit the dead put a stone down. Because they don't want the dead to think they're forgotten. Which defies rationality that they're not there anymore. It also tells other people that this grave has not been forgotten, which doesn't defy rationality. But when you have lost the body and you say the prayer for the dead, you put a stone down wherever you are. The body isn't there. Now, I know all about it. I was in Great Britain when Diana died. I spent the week here by accident. I was scheduled to be here. And all over Great Britain were these effigies with notes which said, Dear Diana, I miss you. I kept thinking, who are they talking to? You have evidence of faith-based actions, but you don't think they happen in museums. So in the Holocaust Museum, people put things down, said the prayer for the dead. I said to my director, this is a government museum, and we have a separation of church and state. So I'm thinking of writing a sign, sign which says, no praying here. And the director said, some version louder and more obscene, then go to your room. <laughs> you must be kidding. Of course people are going to pray here. That division about empathy, about emotion, is, the, is one of the 21st century wranglings. But in this time where people are scared, scared is an emotion, we're going to have to confront ourselves of dealing with what are the tools of emotional confrontation. And how do we accept that all things that we are displaying and talking about are not necessarily in the knowledge structure of rational thinking? It's interested me forever, but there's lots of people now working on that. So part of the work we're going to do is the thing at the bottom which says, this far and no further. This is the way I think you understand what your moral core is. And one of the things about this phrase and the notion of normative behavior, which we'll stop with, is that it's a movable feast and not known to everybody. Everyone has their own moral core, unless you're Donald Trump, who has not. <laughs> I mean, that's, if you look at him from a clinical point of view, one of the ways that you understand it is that he has a lot of anger but no moral core. He has no limits. We have limits. And the limits are determined for ourselves with this far and no further. It's the only criteria I have figured out for us to interrogate ourselves. As Hillary said yesterday, you don't leave your job necessarily, but you have to be prepared that when they go further than this far and no further that you will in fact leave. There is some place in your personal life where this far and no further kicks in. The problem is it's not the same as your neighbors. And in fact often we don't know where it is. But there is such a place that's what defines your moral core. Otherwise, you don't have one. If there is no further, if there's no further, if you'll go everywhere, that's the definition that you have no moral core. That's how people got themselves to.
to do these unspeakable acts. So I'm in my new position thinking that exhibitions that are in your face, which we used to think of as brave, are the worst healing possibility because they isolate you from the get-go. They are not sympathetic to you if you are not, before you enter, sympathetic to them. And one of the things I'm going to ask you to do is start to write down exhibitions that might not be those type of in-your-face exhibitions. But this is, this is about structure. And this Mako said this yesterday. We have been used to ways of writing labels. They are reductionist. They by accident teach people that things are simple. This is that. In ancient times they did this. Well, we all know that in ancient times they did a whole lot of things, some of which, or even most of which, was this. But there were other things going on at the same time because the world is a complex place. And I'm interested in us starting to experiment with exhibition modalities which make it possible for people to understand complex ideas, unreconciled ideas, live within us and our society all the time. What we have to do to heal society is make room for them. Let me go back and talk about ambivalence. Ambivalence is a, a psychiatric term usually used diagnostically, which says that I want two things with equal fervor at the same time and it causes me an action. Usually we get over it and we pick one. But wanting two things that are different or that are opposite at the same time uh, often happens. It's a human condition. I want to figure out how to have people be comfortable with that rather than think that's terrible. I want to figure out how people understand that there's not only winners and losers, but that there is both and. That and is an important conjunction that we all have faith and rationality. Or as the Indian community wants to tell you, the American Indian community, they have a foot in two worlds. They are both and. Intersectionality as a term is a term to try and get us to understand that we are many things simultaneously, bits and pieces, and we recombine them in different ways. We aren't only our sexual orientation, or our culture, or our age, or our gender, but are all of them, and we rely on different ones at different times, but we don't teach that in our museums. This is a gender exhibition. Okay? So it's helpful to be simplistic, and in fact, neurology suggests we want it to be simplistic. I just want to give us a harder time than we're giving because I want us to forgive ourselves, and I want us to forgive the other. Um, one of the things we know, for example, in my country there's endless generations of arguments about abortion. Well, the reality about abortion is it's terrible. And women who have an abortion feel terrible afterwards. It's biologically terrible for your body. Your body is set to do something, you rip it out, and your body's hormonal system goes completely haywire over that. What we are really arguing about is given the terrible choices a woman is facing in a place where a decision needs to be made, she should be allowed to be, make that decision. And we should have the support <coughs> system for her so that once made the decision, whatever it is, we can support that. That's really where the argument should be, but that's not where the argument is in America. There's this, that's murder, and this, the woman's right. I want to get to the place where we say, 
oh my goodness, this is a terrible decision. We have systems for you in place, but we understand that in the last resort you have a decision to make, and we will respect that. that that way of thinking means we have to start to prepare kids to have that way of thinking. This is not this or that, but over here there's overlap. And in fact, the overlap is much bigger than we understand. And my question to you in the museum world is if we're going to get the leave and remain people back together, how are you going to do that? And what systems of thinking are you going to reintroduce so that we recognize our citizenry as members of our citizenry, not as the enemy. So, I don't know in your country, but in my country every day, they want to talk about Donald Trump is violating the norms. Do they do that in your country too? The norms. It's a wonderful word, but nobody knows what it means. What are the norms, and how is he violating them? So, what the norms are is everything in which we agree without words or law of ways of common behavior. They're bedrock. But, unlike bedrock, we move them all the time. They are not codified. If they were codified, they'd be law. But it turns out without them, they're the glue that allows society to work. The one I use all the time is the queue in your supermarket. And do you understand the queue in other people's supermarkets in other countries work differently? So, I used to live in Walthamstow. I owned a home in Walthamstow. In the upper street of Walthamstow, there was a market every week. And in the beginning, I would go down and I would stand here and nobody would wait on me. And I could decide, and did in the beginning, it's because I'm an American. They don't like me or something. No, it turns out that the normative behavior in the upper street market is if you're not standing on the queue, you are a non-person. We don't say get in line. In America, we're ruder. Hey, buddy, don't you know the line starts over there is what we will say. But this is a very polite country, so I'm standing there with my tomatoes, and no one is waiting on me. Because the line forms in this direction, and I am standing in this direction. Now, how do you learn it? Well, eventually, if you want to buy tomatoes, <laughs> that's normative behavior. How did you learn that? And that's, um, I lived here in 19, between 1984 and 1987. So if I go now, has the queue behavior changed because you've had an influx of, um, of immigrants who have different queue behavior? Maybe. And the line may be straight out, or there may be no line, or in India, there's no line. There's everybody for themselves screaming. Which, if you need to get a plane ticket, you learn really um, quickly. But in America, what we call the line has social justice in it. So if you're an old lady, you can get to the <coughs> head of it. I have a cane. It's really wonderful. <laughs> I should have bought one before I needed it. <laughs> if you have a baby, especially a screaming baby, you can get in the front. If you're a young boy and you sneak in the line, you get ousted. That's where, hey buddy, don't you know where? The line is in the back. And if you are, usually they say sorry, man, and they get Not always. And then the whole line will turn on them. And they'll get socially isolated. And there's risk in all of that. But that's what normative behavior works like. So violating the norm is very complicated because you didn't know the norm in the first place. And it's moving. But it is the glue that keeps society together. 
It's the bedrock on which we agree. Um, Hillary Clinton wrote a book called It Takes a Village. It really should have been the normative behavior of child rearing practices in our neighborhood. You know, a baby has run out of the house and is going to get in the street. We have responsibility. That's normative behavior. That's not law. How big are we responsible for children whose names we don't know? Is, is part of the normative world. So you get this. So you don't have to write this stuff down. But And what we've discovered, because we don't have rules about Donald Trump, is that he violates normative behavior, and since it's not laws, we, we don't know how to say, hey, buddy, the line is at the back. I mean, we say it, and he says, I don't care. And mostly when big guys say, I don't care, and the line is at the back, and we're all little guys with canes, we let them go through, and that's the problem that's going on in America, except the stakes are much, much higher. So the question for you is, how do you know what the normative behavior in your museum is? How do you interrogate it? How do you learn from it? How do you make company culture? How do you signal it? So I have a, I have two, now I'll figure out if I can figure out how to do this. Um, I want the other two um, PowerPoints to show up. Do you know how to do this right? Here comes my angel. <laughs> Can we have a hand? <laughs> Not hero. Hey, I don't know. Do we have to hit escape? Oh, well, then it may be in. Um. Oh, you can hit the right Maybe I can figure this out. Just stand here. Don't go away. Yeah, great. So on www. Slideshare or my thing, there's something called the civility worksheets. <coughs> These are ways to interrogate yourself and your staff about your assumptions. I'm, we're not going to play with them. They're yours to use. They're an exercise inside your museum to try and figure out what the normative behavior of your museums are and how you want to change them. They include, do we, um, what do we think of our audience? What do we really think of our audience? Who do we really think they are? They're our friends, they're our students, they're dumber than we, they're like us, because it will determine the whole company culture, but also the way in which you do exhibitions. What's the tone of your labels? Are they the tone of labels of friends, of people you think will understand? Who are they? So, that's what that's about. Oh, you get to see when my birthday is. You're not supposed to. <laughs> Next week, but I'm sorry about that. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Um, <coughs> okay. So let me show you. This is moral core stuff. So this is David Brooke. Actually, his name is Brooks, so I even misspelled it. David Brooks is a Jew, a <coughs> columnist for the New York Times, a Republican, and one of the first people to call out Donald Trump, like Krugman. David Brooks and Krugman are not friends. It was part of like, really? The, Really? David Brooke, after Donald Trump became elected and after a personal crisis, decided to spend his life about moral cores, about values. And this is his list. And one of the things 
that I would do with you is for you to write down your list of bedrock values. So why don't we take, this is, I usually say to myself, what is it I teach my children? What is when my children violate it, not knowing, they get punished? What is that? Where are the bedrock values? So take a second about what are your bedrock values? This is his. This was an article he wrote. This is why he wrote it. So shout at me as, as Hillary says I can catch. Love. Love? You've just written this. I didn't write this. And it means, that's where you saw the oddball in the front. It means that you have to build a staff capacity which says we have limits around kindness this far and no further, but the limits are bigger than my definition because we start to make room for the differences of our neighbors. So one man's compassion gets added to our compassion. One of the ways people look at how robust your um, company culture is, is what do you do with the oddball, with the eccentric? If you make room for the eccentric, that's what I'm talking about. Do you have room in your place so that we could have people of different sum values and a big common bill? And do we know how to do that? Does that make sense? OK. David, are we ending when? Um, we're having coffee at quarter past 11. We're ending at quarter past 11. But we could stretch it a bit. No! <laughs> oh my God. Of course not. No, it's quite about the quarter past 11, get up, even if I'm in mid-sentence. <laughs> Fox News, um, I don't know if you know what Fox News is, it's owned by Rupert Murdoch. It's the only thing Trump watches or used to watch. Trump does not come to the office before noon. He has something known as executive time. <laughs> it turns out he's in his pajamas. He's had a TV screen put in the dining room and he's watching Fox News. He's Twittering what Fox News has on and the left wing that I belong to works desperately hard to get Fox News to put something on <laughs> during his executive time that might mean that he would know something about what the left wing wants. So that's their strategy. Could we buy an ad on Fox News is a left wing strategy so that Trump in his pajamas could see it. That, they are beginning to turn on Trump. It's a very good sign. 
here's evidence of that. It can happen and it starts with empathy is how this ends. Empathy is not Fox News's favorite word, but evidently, ASLH is the Association of Science in America. American Association of Science and something I don't even remember anymore. This is um, personal safety and security. These are rules of civility. And in fact, everybody, look up Google, look up Wikipedia, everybody is writing rules of civil discourse. Because we don't know what to do about civil discourse, people are beginning to write rules. Civil discourse is, is a normative behavior. My children have a code word for it, which is, we don't say shut up to our mother. <laughs> That's normative behavior. Where did they learn that? That's because I put my finger out and said, you don't say shut up to your mother. That's what this is. This is codified. Many people have had to do this, mostly universities. Compromise is something I'm really, really interested in. And what I said yesterday is, what we've learned only is the last definition of compromise, not the good definitions of compromise. Compromise is for Wimps, compromise is a bad thing, compromise is giving up all your things and only the other guy wins. Really, the definition is not that. This is one definition, this is another definition. Notice four is a terrible one, but it, you had to get to four to get there. Could we teach compromise inside our museum as we do exhibitions? A good compromise system so kids could see and your citizens could see how compromise works, how civil discourse works. Could we model that stuff? So here is, this is Donald Trump speaking without understanding what he's saying. And this is how he operates, and this is why we're afraid. You understand all children in America in public schools now have training for active shooters. The anxiety of children in the United States is geared to the fact that active shooters go into school and kill the school children. And they hear that. And you can, in America, buy a backpack that is bulletproof. I'm not quite sure what you would do with that, but the notion that a parent would buy a bulletproof backpack for their six-year-old, Donald Trump says we have nothing to worry about. He will not pass gun legislation, but children have nothing to worry about, because I, Donald Trump, have said so. That's the emergency of America. So I'm going to end this, and then we're going to play. Oh, we have a half hour to play. So this is Alzheimer's. It's an advert. When I saw it, I thought, this is how I'm going to end my speech. It's perfect. It's everything I want to say. There's some things you need to know. Um, one is that Republicans in my country are signified by the color red. Democrats in my country are signified by the color blue and states in play are signified by the color purple. Alzheimer's as their, the Alzheimer's Association, as their color is purple. Well, before I play it, so I tell my husband, the Minnesotan that everybody likes, I say, this is the wonderful thing. You see America is trying to heal. Here is the, here's a 30 second advert. It's by a not-for-profit, we all have people with Alzheimer's in our family. This is just what I'm trying to get to convey. It'll be perfect. And he says, this is the most cynical ad I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> really, I said, and I'm married to you. So 
Here is a moment in which my compromising skills were at play. But also, I give it to you so you can decide, is this everything she was going to say? Or is this the most cynical 30 seconds you've ever seen? Ah, uh, you're going to make this happen for me? <laughs> Does he get another round of applause? <laughs> well, it's not there yet, so don't play. <laughs> by not only 
amount of money, but we're divided by language. Puerto Ricanos speak Spanish, some of them speak English, some pidgin English, mostly North Americans known as gringos, which is a pejorative, but um, speak English, not Spanish. Though I speak 200 words efficiently placed, but no conjoining words in it. As Mako says, I can order ice cream with great facility. <laughs> Otherwise, not so much. So what happened to an island that was abandoned and in which anarchy and violence was beginning to break out? The island saved itself. And it saved itself by doing a few things. And we're going to simulate that. That's what we're about to do. One is the white people on the island came from North America and had contacts and had leverage. It's not the richest island. In fact, our richest people are not rich people. We have no billionaires. But we have rich people. The Puerto Ricans know what to do in a time like this. They have skills beyond. <coughs> they have sharing. They're related to everybody. No one would consider having food only for themselves. So people started to put their assets on the table. And what this is, I, I sit on the board of directors that, of something called Vacus Love. And if you want to look it up later, it's a really interesting thing. It started as a GoFundMe site on the day of the hurricane within Five weeks it had a million and a half dollars, but it was the only site that was really connecting North America and Puerto Rico, and we had money. And we started to fly in. Who knew that very rich gypsy pilots take their private planes to find the, the um, rules because all the airspace was shut down and start to fly? as mercy things. So we could buy whole pharmacies, fly them in, we could fly people out, we had the money to do that. What happened, and it continues to happen, is that everything equals one. And I'll explain what that means, and then you'll write down what you're asking for. If you had a shovel, you had one asset. People didn't know that that's what they were doing, but that's what they were doing. Living on my island is the former governor of the state of New York. He can make a single phone call into the largest Puerto Rican state of the United States, New York, and talk to that governor. That equals one. What they did is demonetize the what you had as asset, right? You can fix my roof is one. I can call the electric company president is one. And the island started to trade assets and continues to do that. And Vyacheslav is the de facto pseudo government that trades assets. It's run half by Puerto Ricans and Vyacheslav uh, half by white guys. We decide when you call Pataki, the former governor, and say now is the phone. And yet it saved itself, pulled its food, brought in its electricity, though it took six months, um, started to fly in five different kinds of, of um, ways of communication. So we just missed Dorian. It came straight to us and decided two hours before to veer north, thank God. But in that test, we discovered that our five systems of of communication work, all of which we paid for, which is infrastructure. All we had was money, that equals one. There's nothing about money that's useful. What it was useful is people stood up and said, yes, I'll become a ham radio operator. We said, fine, we'll pay for your ham radio license. We have 16 ham radio operators. We bought the ham radios. We have a system we can no longer be available. That, based on the beginning of what I talked about, is called network theory. You can read about this. People, my son-in-law who teaches network theory came in, 
talk to the people for whom network theory was an operation uses us as an example. You are about to play the game. What asset do you have? Now let me give you examples of assets you might have. I know how to knit. I know how to babysit. I'm a good cook. I'll shop for you. I like old people. I don't care what asset you have. It only equals one, and that's the interesting thing. It is not a hierarchy. Hatami was the governor of New York. Good on him. He ain't now. He has one phone call. We're going to use it. He wants to use it. That's his one. He's happy to use it. Because he doesn't have a shovel. And he needs somebody. He, it's a bartering system of changing assets without monetizing them. It's understanding that the community all has assets. It's a way of you beginning to deal with strangers. That means that you have assets, and they have assets, and they are not a hierarchy of assets. Under network theory, you don't use anybody else until you need them. Pataki made the phone call himself, but actually waited for us because he knew he wanted to use it one shot at the moment where we needed something. Dialysis, I think, is what he got shipped in. So write down your assets without regard to money, though money could be one of your assets, but it's an ingredient. And then go stand around everyone, and then start to walk up and down and see if you need anybody else's assets and if you can make a trip. And that's the end of this. And if you get tired, you can have coffee. And, and then tell me later. We'll ask you later, does this work? Because I've never done this before. Great. Um, I think you will have noticed Elaine's technique, her cunning technique, um, but we're not going to let her get away with it, which is that she threw in some bombs during this uh, presentation <laughs> and then stepped away and we had coffee. Uh, I think I want to give an opportunity for anybody who wishes to uh, challenge, question, explore, support, or whatever you wish to do in response to her presentation and the, and the activity as well. I think the activity is really interesting too. Um, so, again, uh, does anybody want to respond? I, 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 I'm oh. the right of Windberg about healing everyone. There is outside the acceptable norm. We put people in jail for murder. And once I started to understand that with healing, I also had to understand that I did not mean everyone. And that I understood that outside the norm was a movable line which uh, I wouldn't necessarily agree, but at some point we would agree. 
then I had to start to look at, in, in the Holocaust narrative, there are five simplified roles. There's the victim and the perpetrator. But then there's the bystander and the resistor. And I always forget who the fifth is, but it'll come to me. So the bystander is afraid, but not necessarily without any common humanity. And so I started to think every mother has a son, and there are some people on the other side for whom, and one of the things we didn't do is start to name exhibitions where strangers might come and behave right and take their own things <coughs> away from it. Did I really, in the yesterday let go thing, did I really need people to come to my exhibition to only take away what I wanted them to take away? And I had a friend, um, I have a friend named Ian Whitty. He's the poet laureate of New Zealand, but he's also a curator. And he wrote, as a curator, I want to do a museum about war where people study bicycles. <coughs> this notion that you can take away from a, a large set of raw data something else. I realized there were people in the, in the five sections of the Holocaust actor that I would find acceptable to be in the same space with. Not if we had to discuss the Holocaust and the role in it, but if we were going to an exhibition about food or an exhibition about furniture making. And then I start, that's when I started to move myself into a kind of centrist position. Do we have acceptable topics where many people can find their way in, but people who <coughs> want to do harm with people with guns are not acceptable? So there are outliers not acceptable, but there are people in, in America, sometimes they're called people who held their nose and voted for Trump. I don't know them, but I think I could find some commonality with them. And there are people called Never Trumpers. Never Trumpers <coughs> are Republicans who did not vote for the Democrat, but they did not vote for Trump. So Trump's number was under, under numbered from the total voters because there were Never Trumpers. I think I could find some commonality if we didn't talk politics. So that's what I started to do. How can I invite in people where we have humane commonalities about children, about food, about other things, and how can I make the space start to have as exhibition places where more than my friends find themselves? Understanding that not everyone is one, okay. and trying to figure that out. Does that help? That's very helpful, thank you. Anybody else? There's another hand. Right, so I have a question about that whole issue about museum labels and everyone has a phone now. Uh, and in some ways, that's really exciting because people have so much more access to information and can and some of that information is challenging and different in its interpretation. But some of that information as well can look very plausible, but if you're not an expert in that area, you, you may not realize that it's coming from a very dark and sinister place, and it's not true, um, and it's part of, again, a, quite a sinister agenda. Um, and it's, you know, it's definitely, in, in terms of my own career, something I'm experiencing a lot more where people are coming to me and saying, oh, you know, you're, you and your museum are wrong here because, you know, I have read this online and I have researched this online. And, you know, it's not just museums, but like even the whole kind of anti-vaxxer thing and all that kind of thing. So what do you think our role, is it sometimes really important for us to say we have authority and we know things because we've spent the time and done this in an ethical and, and, and with integrity? So you're going to watch me as a project manager of big institutions. Uh, this is a fair argument and if you watch this interchange you'll also watch that there is ways in which expansion and compromise can happen. First of all, that's 
a, not only a usual argument, but the reason it's a usual argument is it has real truth in it. The thing that I would then talk to you about is how far and no further. So there's dark information. We don't want people to do that. On the other hand, they would like to know other information. So my feeling is we need to retrain curators to be <coughs> generous knowledge gatherers. So if I said to you about this topic, would you give me your top five locations of information that you like because you, you've studied this, but they're not all yours. That would be a new role for you, but it would be within your wheelhouse, right? You would be willing to do that. If I, yeah. if I pointed out that we could have a system which said about this thing, it's called more about when you do layering, We'll give you a handout of where some more information is. Don't you think the public would rather you help them than they have to go to Google and they don't know the value of the sites? Who would we, I suppose we would, I would feel that we would be doing that kind of thing already. So, you know, if, for example, one of the really interesting ways to talk about objects now I find is actually on social media because you have the ability to say, here's a link to somebody else who's written about this. And it's, because most of the time, you know, they may tell tales at school, but a lot of the time, our collections are so vast, we know we aren't experts. We are kind of very general a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And we're relying on good sources of knowledge. And usually we're, we should be ethically very honest with the public saying, this is where we're getting our information. Well. So most people don't do that. So you're way ahead. Most people don't do that. that. That transparency which says, here is other information. And you could, you not, I'm <coughs> synthesizing other information. I'm not talking about the editing function of my background <coughs> research. I'm talking about raw data. Here is where I got my information. Link, 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 link. Have at it. Then I'll have at it if I want to, or otherwise not. But generally what happens is that you do the research and then you give us the fruits of your research. Mm -hmm. How about don't do that? Is there a way you and I can work together about a system that won't be cluttering your mind, cluttering the exhibition in the easy way? So you're nodding your head? Yeah. So you and I have a contract now for a project which changes the very expectation of the visitors in the museum. I don't have to look it up. They will help me. They are knowledgeable. I don't, therefore I'll trust them. Now you've established a very different relationship with your visitor, even if you do it once. And a whole different thing happens because I believe in something called silt, which is things are both themselves and they are indicators of other things. So this is silt, which says, I believe you are smart, you the visitor. I believe if I give you a lot of information, you will do with it what you want, not I will feed you pabulum. And because you've told me that, even though I'm not interested in your thing, I now understand you and I have a different relationship. So it's a huge asset of the institution, even though I don't use it. I just, I just wondering, on that, is it really, uh, not to simplify too much, but is it about just allowing space for multiple narratives then? So the fact that nothing is really constant a lot of the time. So like, I mean, for example, we have objects in the collection in the gallery that were very definitively attributed to a particular artist, and then new research comes out of new technologies, and that's changed, and it's reattributed, and, you know, but definitively people were told, this is by this person, and it was done at this time. And I just wonder, is it about, like, not just, this in terms of labels, but also some of the discussion we've had around being able to bring people together and like a lot of the time the objects are not going to change in our institution so is it just giving space to the multiple narratives to the different lenses that we can shine on them but also being open <coughs> to other interpretations it's not that the research changes the object doesn't change definitively but just there can be other narratives to it is that well and not only that the process is transparent and I'm not talking about our labels are getting longer. There are things like data dots. There are things like access to computer 
things there, things like putting them online and telling people as they come in, if you open your computer to this, this is your guide. There are things like paper takeaways. There are all kinds of ways to tell them. But if you tell them about process, we used to think this was by this person, now it's by that person. You're doing in the silt way, making it clear that you're a person, you weren't always right, the institution wasn't always right, I'm a person, I'm not always right. I can relate to the institution on a different basis. So everything has meaning both itself and in a metaphoric way. So it changes the implied contract between you, the personnel of the museum, and you, the audience, in a way that I think is very affirming. Any other comments, responses? Yeah. So I'm for messy. I'm finished. Everyone doesn't have anything. Does that mean no one gets it until we find out everyone has it? Or does it mean we understand you could borrow it, but if you have, or do we have systems in our head that says we're in dialogue even though we don't see the people, and we need to design systems and then write the decoding of them. So should some small percentage of people want this, we have this. And the issue about how time consuming it is, is both true, but you have 50, 60 years of data you made for different purposes. You have old school programs you no longer use. You have the data that was first put in the collection, then the other fields that were put in later, the unearthing of the stuff you have for different purposes is already a lot. And the fact that you don't have it for everyone will forgive you. People are forgiving if you like them. So this notion about because we don't have it all, we can't have any. I, I am in the other camp. Let's have what we have. Let's tell people we're working on it. Let's, we're only people here. And they're only people. Let's try and figure out what we're doing with that. Yeah. But within that, the digital barrier, there's other knowledge barriers that exist. You need a certain cultural capital in order to say, okay, this is what the museum says, these are other sources. I'm gonna have a look around and make up my own mind. I work with young people and the lower their socioeconomic background and the less well they've done in school, the less likely they are to say, I am confident enough to stand inside this really imposing building where everything is framed in gold and make up my own mind. And I think Brexit is partially not going to be solved by complexity because it is a retreat against complexity and an anger against complexity. I don't even understand this back a backstop thing, just get it over and done with. It's that level of thinking which wants a simple answer. So we can throw out all these seeds where people can get all these answers for the people who most need it and who we should most be trying to reach are the least likely to take these things. Or not. <laughs> or not. <laughs> so if you were on my staff, <coughs> yeah. you would be so overworked. Because every time you did what you just did, I'd say, right. And you represent those people and you figure out a different layer of system, like hacking, like making your own tour, which will make for other people, like another way to have it, like paper being passed around, like puzzles, like hidden things. You tell me it's going to happen. Because I don't have to solve that problem 
in contradistinction to your problem. In the and world, I could have all of it. Not all of it everywhere because we don't have the money, but all of it somewhere. So if you have a, they won't come unless they have a bus pass. <coughs> I'm buying bus passes. Mm. So in each case, you have to come to me with the solution because I'm not fussed about what the solution is. I'm going to do it. So there are museums that use black light, which are hidden messages, and mm. you could borrow the black light. There are museums where you can write your own labels. There are hackathons. There are, good, let's do it. it I don't use the institution as a precious place. I use the institution as everyone owns the stuff. It's theirs. So if you tell me all my systems are nice, but you have a different system, I'm going to tell you, you make it because I'm for it. And here's the money. <laughs> so you want to know how I got the money? I, my institutions have entrepreneurial systems because she doesn't need a lot of money. So we have, I don't know, in the budget, $5,000, $10,000. You can apply for it. You have an idea. Your tryout is in cardboard. Here's $200. Comes in my budget. Staff with good ideas on any level can figure out a system that they're going to want. Because I don't want somebody to stand up and say, but how about? Because the responsibility is in all layers. And if you have a good idea, I'm giving you the money. Yes. Last, last question. Yep. So, it's kind of similarly linked to what Sarah said. <clears throat> How do we break that down to a local level in that a lot of the people who can benefit in that way are in our local communities not necessarily accessing national collections and national institutions. They may be visiting a local museum that has even an eight a 16th, a 36th of, of whatever is, is resource available. So how do we enable those smaller organizations that are acting entrepreneurially and are much more efficient and have smaller turning circles and can respond, but how do we enable them to embed this sort of thing? Yeah, sorry. Well, I think small is the new big, big is what I've said for a long time. So. Um, First of all, if you go look at the small places they're doing it, they're just not telling you. Because the cost to small places to do anything is very little. Because the amount of people using it, at a certain time everything breaks if you have 500,000 users. But if you have 2,000 users, you can make it out of cardboard. And so the material, materiality for small museums is cheap, and therefore playing in small museums is easy. So all you need is permission to yourself and not tell anybody. <laughs> Ask for forgiveness. Um, much of the great um, museum experimentation happens that way. We're not telling you, please don't look at it. Nina Simon took over a failing museum in a small city. She could not have managed what she managed in a big museum because the Met had lots of systems to prevent her, but who was watching her? Nobody. So the small places need permission and they need to stop thinking, but that's not really museum-y. And that the supervisors can help with. Anything is museum-y if you say it is. Great. I think it's lunch. <laughs> I, actually, before you leave, I always ask the same question. I'm only interested in use. Um, I understand I'm entertaining. I've been doing this a long time. What I, what I care about is usefulness. Would you tell me what use you're going to make out of this? I'm going to go back and ask for forgiveness after I've done everything you suggested. Okay. <laughs> I have somebody to say that, so I'm getting over it. How is it going? Got a lot of witnesses here. <laughs> <laughs> She's already gone. <laughs> <laughs> I think what I hope to do is, after this, that we have time to reflect. I think there's a few and kind of things that we need to let me look at the ways that. Start implementing things and slowly start changing things because I 
to to other people and slowly get people to realise what impact we can have by doing this. I think that would be really important. I think that would be quite a way that we we do it. Um, you can all use my name in vain. I won't be there. <laughs> you can make up what I said. <laughs> <It's all fine. laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you.